Good morning, church. Here we go again. We'll open your Bible, please. The first Kings chapter two. We're going to end the series that we've been in since the beginning of the year on the life and leadership of King David. I can't think of a better time to land this series on leadership than game day, Super Bowl Sunday. At this very moment, two teams are gathering in the locker room to play the biggest game of their lives. And do you understand what we do on a Sunday morning? We're gathered in the locker room. The game's not in here. The game is out there. And we're preparing for the biggest game of our lives, the one that really, really matters. Yes, I know there's a bunch of red in this church. And wherever you're watching from, from anywhere in the world, I know that you're a part of Chief's Kingdom too, up in Cedar Falls, Iowa, yeah, Quebec, Canada. But whether or not you're part of the chief's kingdom, we're part of the Jesus kingdom. And the one that will last forever, the one that really, really, really matters. Now, there's several side stories that kind of come out of Super Bowl week. Uh, Brock Purdy is one of them. I shared that story a week ago. Mr. Irrelevant, chosen last in the 2022 draft, now leading his team into the Super Bowl. Uh, Another side story, you guys know about the 12th man for the Kansas City Chiefs, Taylor Swift. (laughs) The secret weapon. Right? But here's another side story that hadn't really been talked about enough. Of course, Andy Reid, we all know, Hall of Fame head coach for the Kansas City Chiefs. But what is interesting is his coaching tree. Check this out. Of 31 head coaches in the NFL, 10 of them have been personally mentored by Andy Reid. What a coaching legacy. What a coaching tree. And some of them have had immense success of their own having coached with him and been mentored by him. As a matter of fact, Doug Peterson took the Philadelphia Eagles, our coach's old team, to the Super Bowl and actually won it, a place that Andy Reid never did. I mean, what a legacy, honestly. Think about that for a moment. A coaching tree. He's passing on what? His knowledge and expertise to others. That's more than success. That is significance. Now open up like that today to say this, as members of the Jesus kingdom, in some way, this should embody our lives. We should all have a family tree. And I want to talk today as we land this series on the life and leadership of David. Remember, we're all leaders. We're all called to be someone's leader. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, making disciples of Jesus Christ, we're all called to be someone's leader. And what that means is the call of every leader is to prepare and pass the mantle of leadership to the next generation. That's the call of every leader. In this series, as we've examined David's life and leadership, we've seen the character of a leader, the courage of a leader, the company of a leader, the crucible of a leader, the compromise of a leader, the consecration and confidence of a leader. And today I want to talk about the call upon every single leader. That call is that every leader prepares and passes the mantle of leadership to the next generation. Now, what does that mean, the mantle of leadership? That's not of vernacular we use very often. Just think in terms of the authority, the responsibility of leadership. Every generation is to pass that weight and responsibility to the next generation. And when I'm talking about leadership, I mean kingdom leadership. We accept the mantle of the gospel to advance it to the next generation, and they accept that mantle of the gospel to advance it to the next generation, and that is how the Christian faith has gone on for the last 2,000 years of church history, every single generation preparing and passing it to the next generation. And that's what we see David now doing in the life of Solomon, his successor. He is preparing and passing the mantle of kingdom leadership on to the next generation. He knows that he is about to die. In fact, he knows that his days are almost over. And these might be some of the last words ever spoken to his son Solomon, as Solomon is about to now assume the throne over all of Israel. We can see David passing on three things to the next generation. He wants to pass on three things to his son Solomon, who will be king over Israel. And remember, in some way, we're all called to be kings, Revelation 1 and verse 6, Revelation 5 and verse 10. We're all kingdom leaders in the kingdom of God. He has made us to be both priests and kings. And it says, we shall reign on the earth. And I want you to see the imagery today, and I want you to see the history today, because it's relevant to you and I today in the 21st century. The number one thing, first of all, the three things that David passes on to his son, number one is spiritual tenacity. 
We have got to pass on to the next generation spiritual tenacity. Whether you're a mother raising up a daughter to know Jesus, uh, this is what you must pass on to her. Maybe you're a father raising up sons. The most important leadership titles I've said before is mama and daddy. Those are the most important leadership titles you will ever have. In whatever capacity, as a kingdom leader, This is the number one thing you want to pass on, a spiritual tenacity. And this is what David now says to his son Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. I know we don't like to think about it, but one day we're all going the way of all the earth. There's all a destination. There's nobody that gets an exemption. And every single decision should be made in view of the destination. The day we go the way of all the earth, will we pass to the next generation the mantle of leadership? This is what David is now doing. Look at what he says now. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. He's looking at Solomon, a young, young man. He's saying, son, you're about to be king. And this is a grown man's game. You're about to assume the mantle of leadership. And this is not a child's game. Son, you have this in you. I believe in you. But it's time to prove yourself a man. What he's saying is is language that warriors would have used. In fact, warriors have used these from the dawn of, of history. As they're going into battle, they would say something like this. Today, let's prove ourselves men. If today we die, let's die like men. What he's saying to his son Solomon who hadn't been a warrior like his father. Son, this is going to take a warrior's mentality if you're going to have the kingship and the authority and the mantle of leadership. It's going to demand spiritual tenacity. What does that mean, tenacity? It means a never give up mentality, a no compromise mentality, a a, a no surrender mentality, a never give up, never give in never retreat kind of mentality. See, that's a a warrior's mentality and spiritual tenacity demands a warrior's mentality that's the opposite of spiritual apathy and passivity. I would suggest the reason the early church took the gospel to the ends of the earth in less than a century is because those early Christians had a warrior's mentality. They knew that they were at war. They did not have the home field advantage. They were not mainstream in Roman society. They were hated by almost everybody. They knew the faith would cost them personally, and that's why you could not stop them. They had a warrior's mentality. On the other hand, the church in the West, where other Christians historically have been forced to die, the church in the West, Satan had a different type of strategy. Just going to leave them alone. And what Satan could not do outwardly through persecution, he has done in Western civilization through inner erosion. Just leave them alone. That way they won't have a warrior's mentality. See, we as the church in the West think we're at peace. It's a peacetime mentality when the reality is the battle for a kingdom has never, ever been at peace. It's not a peacetime mentality. It demands a warrior mentality. We're at war for the souls of men, for the souls of women. Ephesians six twelve is not allegory. No, Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age and spiritual wickedness and high places. Listen, we need to have a warrior's edge, a warrior's mentality, a spiritual tenacity because what happens apart from spiritual tenacity a warrior's mentality we end up having spiritual passivity and apathy and here's what happens when you have spiritual apathy you eventually lose that warrior's mentality And this is why another father in the faith is passing on the same advice to his son, Timothy. Almost the very same thing that David says to Solomon, you you now have Paul saying to Timothy, almost a thousand years later, look what he says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You have David that says to Solomon, son, be strong. Now now you have Paul who's saying to another son, his spiritual son, Timothy, be strong. 
Now listen, if we're going to have spiritual tenacity, then what are we to be strong in? He says to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I told you in this series, I thought at one time it was guts and grit. I really did. A warrior's mentality, never retreat, never give up, never give in. I mean, I kick doors in for a living. We're going to kick in doors for Jesus and take names for Jesus and take no prisoners. Boy, did I learn. Satan's a worthy adversary. You get punched in the mouth enough, you realize, oh no, I need grace. I don't just need grace to get into heaven. I need grace to get through the day. See, you walk in the grace. Listen, if you want to be strong in grace, you know what that means? It means is acknowledging I need Jesus every moment of every day. I am not too proud to admit I need Jesus every moment of every day. I don't just need Jesus to get into heaven. I need him sometimes to get through the next hour of my day. That's how you have grace to finish the race. And that is what Paul is now telling his son in the faith. Now he goes on. You talk about a warrior's mentality. Paul was a pit bull for Jesus. (laughs) I mean, they literally had to separate his head from his body to stop him. And he's trying to pass on that same tenacity now to Timothy, who's about to take the mantle of leadership from the Apostle Paul. Look what it says in verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I told you, the early church had a warrior's mentality. They understood that no one goes to war without taking a hit. No one goes into combat without eventually getting hurt. It's going to be a combat, contact kind of sport. This is what my coaches used to say in football. Gentlemen, this is a contact sport. It's a sport of collisions. It's a sport where you're going to get hurt, but you get back up again, right? Guess what? That sounds a lot like the Christian life. It sounds a lot about life and leadership. It's a contact sport where people are gonna get hurt. It demands a warrior's mentality, spiritual tenacity, a never ever give up mentality, but it's not grit and guts. It's learning to walk on the grace of God and you live in the grace of God by confessing your complete dependence on God. For then you are weak, yet God says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's when you really become strong. And here's what's at stake. Listen, spiritual apathy never stays just spiritual apathy. It always gives birth to spiritual apostasy. And spiritual apostasy never stays just spiritual apostasy. It then gives birth to spiritual anarchy. And spiritual anarchy never stays spiritual anarchy. It then gives birth to spiritual captivity. Now, I know a lot of you don't know what that means. So let me just explain. I'm trying to use biblical terms. I want you to know the biblical language. Apathy, spiritual apathy. What does that mean? I no longer care about the truth. Now, what? Apathy turns into apostasy. What is apostasy? I'm going to turn from the truth. Apathy says, I don't care about the truth. Apostasy says, I'm going to turn from the truth. What is anarchy? Anarchy says, there is no truth. And now you see the progression, the evolution of Western civilization. All of a sudden, the church is walking in apathy, but apathy gives birth to apostasy. We live at a time now where the average Christian church and the average Christian denomination in Western civilization is in a state of apostasy. What does that mean? It means turning from the truth, starting to prostitute the truth of Christianity with the lies of the enemy. Why? Because it's not easy to stand for things things that Jesus stands for in a world that's increasingly hostile to the gospel. It is reprehensible to the world to say that Jesus is the only way. It's reprehensible. It's reprehensible to the world to say, in the eyes of God, marriage is still between a man and a woman. He hadn't changed his mind. It's reprehensible to the world to say, hey, God made male and female. That's it. See, it's reprehensible what happens. If you don't have spiritual tenacity, you will start to compromise just a little bit spiritually to do what is easy. Listen, we are in the world to change the world, but too much of the time the world has gotten into us and changed us. And what happens from spiritual apostasy, it becomes anarchy, where apostasy says, I'm turning from the truth. Anarchy says, there is no truth but my truth. 
And everyone can now do whatever is right in their own eyes. You got your truth, I got my truth. Does that sound familiar? Hey, this is what happened to Solomon. If you look at the life of Solomon, we mostly compared two kings, the tale of two kings, Saul and David. But if we wanted to, there's another tale of two kings, David and his son Solomon. Solomon was not a warrior. In fact, there's not one recorded battle that Solomon ever fought once he became king. He got a kingdom at peace handed to him, the keys. David has secured the borders. He subdued all their enemies. And I'm convinced that was part of Solomon's problem. That which you have not bled for, that which you have not fought for, you will take for granted. David considered it something sacred. He knew the cost. Solomon, he started out well. He didn't end well. David started out well. He had some really, really bad moments along the way. But now he's ending well. And we all know it's not how you start, it's how you finish that really matters. This was the difference between David and Saul. David, the man after God's own heart. They both would spin out and sin and compromise. None of us leave this world with a spotless record. None of us leave this world flawless and sinless. But here's the difference between Saul and David. When Saul would sin, he would spin out. It would take him farther and farther away from God. He never recovered. David, on the other hand, when he would sin, he'd go into a spin, but it would always bring him back to God. His sin always brought him back to God. That's why he's the man after God's own heart. Saul, he started well, or at least okay, didn't end well. David started well, ended well. Solomon starts well, doesn't end well. You know why? Spiritual apathy. We learn right away he starts marrying foreign wives to make alliances with the enemy. He literally begins sleeping with the enemy. God said, Solomon, don't do that. Your foreign wives will turn your heart to other gods. We see right away. He begins worshiping Yahweh, the true and living God, at the high places, the pagan altars, probably to appease his foreign wives who had pagan gods and pagan deities. See, he has spiritual apathy. He's starting to fall into apostasy. By the end of his life, he's in full-blown anarchy. He will take his own sons and offer them as a sacrifice, a child sacrifice on the altar of Molech. He will have his sons burned alive to a false pagan god. And when Solomon dies, you have civil war then, and the kingdom split, and it's never ever the same, and within just a few generations, they will in fact go into captivity. Now you know what is going on in American society. You and I as the church fell into apathy instead of spiritual tenacity, and one generation failed to pass on the faith to the next generation, and that generation failed to pass it on to the next generation. So we now live at a time where morally and spiritually we're in anarchy and in some capacity going into captivity to the lies of the enemy. Now you know what's at stake and why we have to stand with spiritual tenacity, a never give up mentality, a no compromise mentality, because the next generation will take apathy and it will become apostasy. It goes on and on and on and on. Now, with spiritual tenacity comes the second thing, a spiritual integrity. You can see this in the words of David to his son Solomon. Son, you're gonna have to prove yourself a man. It's gonna take a warrior's mentality. You're not a peacetime king. You have to think of 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 a wartime king. And if indeed you have a spiritual tenacity, you will have spiritual integrity. Look what he now says in verse 3. He says to Solomon, And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. What is David saying? The blessing of God comes only through obedience to God. If you want to be blessed by God, you got to live a life obedient to God. What's he saying? Listen very carefully. You are not following the Son of God if you're not following the Word of God. See, we live at a time where people can say, I'm a Christian, self-professing Christians. Oh yeah, I'm following the Son of God, but they're not following the Word of God. You can't separate the two. John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You cannot separate the living word from the written word. No, if you're not following the Son of God, it's because you're not following the word of God. And if you're not following the word of God, don't claim to follow the Son of God. That is completely incongruent. And what David is now reminding his son Solomon, that the blessing of God comes from obeying the word of God. He said this over and over again. He opened up the largest book in the Bible, 150 Psalms, 150 worship songs. Psalm chapter one, verses one through three. Blessed is the man or the woman that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law does he meditate day and night. He shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water who brings forth his fruit in due season and his leaf shall not wither and whatsoever he does shall prosper. No, you can live abundantly. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come to give you life. You can have it abundantly, but you cannot live abundantly unless you're living obediently. And that is what David is now reminding his son Solomon, spiritual integrity brings divine blessing on the next generation, while spiritual idolatry brings a curse. You will either submit to God or submit to Satan. As mortals, we will submit to one or two spiritual authorities. And what we learn in Scripture is that spiritual integrity brings blessing on the next generation, but spiritual idolatry brings a curse. Proverbs 20 and verse 7. Here's, here's one example. A righteous man walks in his integrity, and his children are blessed after him. A righteous man walks in his integrity, and his children are blessed after him. The number one thing I could give my kids is not a yard full of plastic playhouses when they were small and paying for their college when they were old. No, the number one thing I gave to my kids was a father who walked in integrity. It's a divine blessing passed to the next generation. I received it from my father who received it from his father. Now I pass it on to my children so they hopefully will pass it on to their children. Integrity is a blessing on the next generation. But what we learn in scripture is idolatry is a curse. You can see this, for example, in Exodus 20 and verse 5. Look at what God tells the ancient Hebrews, and I would suggest in some way this applies to me and you. You shall not bow down to them, idols nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now listen carefully. This does not mean that God holds children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren accountable for the sins of their fathers. It's not what God is teaching, but he is teaching as fathers or mothers. We can teach what we know, but we will reproduce what we are. And this is why you see generational sins in in many family trees. Alcoholism, for example, you see this often in a family tree. You teach what you know, you reproduce what you are. You see infidelity, sexual immorality, divorce in many family trees. It's generational. Because when you're no longer walking in alliance, in a covenant relationship with God, sin puts you in a covenant relationship with Satan. And now he is free to wreak havoc on an entire family tree. This is what would happen in the days of Solomon. He started worshiping the idols of those around him, and it was complete chaos and confusion in future generations. This is what we've done. I'm convinced in modern America, why is it the youngest among us are having such an identity crisis? I'll tell you why. Because idolatry always will bring a confusion of identity. We've made the gods of sex and money and gender and power and popularity, the gods of modern American society. No, we're too sophisticated to actually worship little graven images carved out of wood and stone. No, we're way too sophisticated for that. But don't think for a moment these ancient gods aren't still around. It's a new day, old gods. Now, here's the reality. Whose I am defines who I am. 
Why is the youngest generation having such an identity crisis? Self-idolatry. We have taught them that they are deities. I know this sounds really jaded, but I just think it's true. We are a generation of narcissists raising a generation of narcissists. What is a narcissist? It's all about me. The universe revolves around me. And if I'm a deity, I have the right to demand that you agree with me. Self-idolatry will always bring a confusion of identity. On the other hand, when I know whose I am, I know who I am. I belong to God. I'm not God. He is God. I'm not. He made me. I didn't make him. He gets to define my identity. See what's happened? We pass this curse of idolatry on to the next generation. On the other hand, I want you to see the rest of this but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. He's talking about a family tree that when we walk in spiritual tenacity and we have spiritual integrity, we pass on the blessing of God to our posterity. Thousands of people that we will never even meet this side of eternity. And what we're really talking about is the third thing. We're talking here about a spiritual legacy. In the same way, Andy Reid has a coaching tree. You and I are to have in some capacity a coaching tree spiritually, a family tree spiritually, a legacy of lives that have been changed by Jesus, Christ in us, Colossians 1.27, the hope of glory. This is what David now says to Solomon, verse 4, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to do their way, Uh, to take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul. He said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David is referring here to a promise God made him in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Theologians call it the Davidic covenant. God promised David that one day one of his sons, one of his seed would sit on his throne forever. And a thousand years later, one of his sons would in fact come, the Messiah, the anointed one the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we learn in Isaiah 9 and verse 7 that when Jesus comes again, he's going to sit on a literal throne in Jerusalem and it's called the throne of David. Yes, God is going to make good on that promise. And it will be David's literal family tree that would one day give birth to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, you're not going to have a family tree that's going to give birth to the Messiah. Forget it. But you should have a family tree spiritually that leads people to the Messiah. Listen, I received my faith from a godly mother and a godly father. But my family tree spiritually did not begin with him. It began in 1961 when an older gentleman named Bob Tao befriended a younger man by the name of Van. He invited that young man to go to church. Over and over again, that man said no. And then one Sunday, that man named Van said yes to Bob Tao. And that young man was my dad. He went to church with this older gentleman. He befriended at work. My dad found Jesus. See, my family tree didn't begin simply with Bob Tao. It began in 1943 with a woman, I don't even know her name. She knocked on the door of a young lady that was pregnant with her first baby. In 1943, Some unnamed kingdom hero, I don't even know her name, invited that young woman to church. Two weeks later, she got saved, heard the gospel, found Jesus, and that baby was my mother. See, that's a family tree spiritually. I received it in the same way. If you know Jesus now, you received your faith from someone who received that faith from someone. Someone passed it on to someone. Someone passed it on from someone. That's how it's carried on for 2,000 years until it was passed on to you. And now as a kingdom leader, the call of God on all of our lives is to pass on what we have received. 
We call this an abundant life discipleship. It's more than evangelism. Find your one. Yes, we all need to be looking for that one that's far from God that needs Jesus. But the job is not done when we find our one. We call it here discipleship. Discipleship is how we build this legacy in this family tree spiritually that will stretch clear into eternity. See, discipleship is not about addition in the kingdom. It's about multiplication in the kingdom. And this has always been God's plan to establish a kingdom from the time he told Adam, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. To be fruitful is about evangelism, find your one. But to fill the earth is to multiply image bearers after the one. And that's discipleship. And that's one of our core values. We've been doing it for 24 years I don't know if you know this or not, but we have a new discipleship material we have just written ourselves. I personally think it's better than ever. Nothing wrong with the old material. It was awesome. It served us well. But this new material is actually built around our six core values as a church. Generosity, evangelism, discipleship, community serving. Twelve lessons around those six core values. What are values, core values? Listen, it's the DNA of our body. In the same way you have DNA physically that defines your identity, you have spiritual DNA in this church body that defines our identity. See, discipleship is more than a classroom setting. Listen, you can reproduce what you know in a classroom. You can reproduce information from a podcast, but discipleship is about reproduction. That takes a relationship. So when I talk about discipleship, I'm not talking about a beginner Bible study. Nothing wrong with those, but this is different. This is built not on a program, but a pattern that Jesus established. He had 12 disciples. What was he doing for three and a half years? He was doing more than simply transferring knowledge. He was transferring life. He was doing more than transferring theology. He was transferring spiritual maturity. That's discipleship. And the thing I'm most excited about right now is recently almost 500 people in our church have been trained in this new discipleship material. Even if you've used the old material, you need to go through the new training. Why? Because it's new material. It's a new tool. And so there's probably another 500 people in our church that need to go through the training. I'm so excited. I'll tell you why. 24 years ago, when we established discipleship as a core value in our church, I took about 25 people aside. I trained them in what it means to disciple. I told them at the time, guys, you are the DNA in our church 10 years from now. You will reproduce the DNA in those that you disciple And these 500 people and other 500 people, you're the DNA of what our church will be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. You see, that's a legacy that we are all to have in some capacity, a coaching tree spiritually. This is the Apostle Paul in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul said to Timothy, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In this one verse, you have four generations of a family tree spiritually. You have Paul and Timothy. You have the faithful men Timothy gives it away to. And then you have others also that those faithful men then give it to four generations in that family tree. Let me ask you, do you have a family tree? I know you do physically, but do you spiritually? We're talking about a legacy. This is how the faith is passed on to the next generation. You pass the baton. And this is the image that the Apostle Paul would often use, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He would say they run for a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. The rest of the world runs for crowns that will one day decay and trophies that will one day fade away. But we are in a game, in a way, a race. And we're running for rewards that will never fade away, crowns that will never ever decay. And in the very same way, you have David passing the baton back to Solomon. You have Paul passing the baton back to those coming behind him through Timothy. You and I, in some way, are to now do the very same thing. We are to pass the baton, the mantle of kingdom leadership behind us to those that are coming behind us. At the same time, you never reach out, you never stop reaching out ahead of you 
for those who are in front of you. I just got back a couple of weeks ago from Oceanside, California. I meet out there a couple of times a year with a bunch of pastors from around our nation. Great friends, fellow preachers, brother pastors, all leading large churches, flying at a very, very high level. I want you to notice, we're all a bunch of young men. Depends on who you ask. Okay, let's be honest. We're all a bunch of middle-aged men. We're all in our 40s and 50s. But there's one man there. He's about 15 years ahead of all of us. That is Larry Osborne, his name. Now, you probably have never heard of Larry Osborne. But if you did what I did, you, you probably have heard of Larry Osborne. Larry Osborne pastors Oceanside Church. Uh, nor, actually, North Coast Church in Oceanside, California. Church with a story very similar to ours. He started in the 1970s with less than 100 people. Today it's a multi-site church, 10,000 plus. What I love about Larry, at 70 years of age, is he is passing the baton to those behind him. He's kind of a pastor to pastor. And about every single week, I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I, in some way, am trying to help other pastors 15 years behind me. Almost every single week, I meet with some pastor in our city. And I never say no to any of them if they ask for help. I try to coach them, help them. As I'm passing the baton behind me, I want you to notice, I'm reaching out ahead of me. You know what I love about Larry Osborne? He's 15 years ahead of me. He's me 15 years from now. See, we all need people like that in our life. We all need people that we're reaching back to, and we all need people that we're reaching out to. That's always how the baton of leadership is passed. It's true of your life individually. It should be true of our life as a church family. We moved into this Lee Summit facility December the 6th, 2015. First service ever. Sunday, December the 6th, 2015. Now, if you come to this Lee Summit campus, there's a good chance you have walked by this and you have never even noticed it. There is in our story room wall, right here in this Lee Summit campus, a time capsule. And that time capsule is going to be opened in December 2045, 30 years after we moved into this facility. Now, in that time capsule, several things. We're, we're sending a message. We're sending a, a legacy. We want our church 30 years from now to know their identity, to remember their history. Uh, what you have in that time capsule is uh, Kansas City Star, dated December the 6th, 2015. Uh, you've got an SD card of the service that day, as if SD cards will even be relevant technology. When they finally open that thing, don't know what we're going to do with this. There's a personal message from me to that pastor, whoever it is, in 2045. And then there's an open letter to the congregation of Abundant Life, 2045. This is just one attempt from this church to pass that legacy on to that next generation that will call Abundant Life their church. Now, there's a lot in this letter. I'm not going to try to read it all, but I just want you to see the very end to understand what we're trying to do, not just individually, but as a church family. Because one day there will be somebody else sitting in that seat. It won't be you. One day there will be another pastor standing on this platform. It will not be me. But if we've done what we're all called to do, we can pass the mantle, we can pass the baton with confidence because we have answered the call to prepare and pass on the mantle of leadership to the next generation. But remember, every decision should be in view of the destination. Here's the last part of that letter. We launched our church known as Abundant Life in March 2000 with around 100 adults in attendance. We had nothing but a dream. But what God has accomplished in our midst in 16 years since can only be coined as miraculous. The church is a sacred thing. Guard her and protect her as the precious bride of Christ. It has come to you at a high price, purchased in blood, baptized in tears, Christ's blood and our tears. We have finished our race. We pass to you the baton of faith. Now it's time for you to run yours. May God bless you as he has blessed us. 
see you at the finish line. To quote my friend and mentor, Larry Osborne, quit worrying about your own legacy. There's only one name that matters, it's Jesus. Only one name to ever be remembered, it's Jesus. <laughs> you know what Larry says? It doesn't really matter what you accomplish 25 years after you die, pretty much the only people that remember you are your kids and grandkids. But if we've done what we're called to do, generations of people, we will meet in eternity in our family tree spiritually. People that will never know our name, and they're not meant to, but they will encounter the name above every name that has ever named the name of Jesus. My prayer is those who come behind us will find us faithful. That's my prayer. Church, it's game day. Two teams are gathered in the locker room. They're about to hit the field. And church, it is game day. Every day for us is game day. Jesus taught our field is the world, and the field is ripe unto harvest. And right now in the locker room, I'd like everyone from everywhere just to stand to their feet at every campus, in our city, Blue Springs, Independence, Johnson County, Crossroads, every church house all over our nation right here in Lee Summit. As we get ready to leave the locker room, I want to consecrate all we are to all that he is, that we would live to see a move of God in our lifetime of biblical proportions, indescribable but undeniable. Would you raise your hands to the heavens? Universal sign of surrender. Jesus, we surrender all that we are for all that you are. It's an honor to be a member of the Jesus kingdom. And long after tonight's game is forgotten, the one that we're in is the one that really matters. Would you fill us, God, with your Holy Spirit? Empower us, Lord Jesus, with the promise of Acts 1-8 to be a powerful, supernatural witness from our neighbors to the nations. God, that we would live to see awakening, revival in our communities, our cities, our families. Would you take us, God? Would you use us, empower us, and help us to answer the greatest call upon all of our lives to prepare and pass on kingdom leadership, to those that are coming behind us. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Would you give him the glory with me? Praise him, would you, church?